Welcome everybody to today's LinkedIn Live. Uh, we are here to celebrate um, our CISL's newest course, Women Leading Change, Shaping Our Future. And I'm delighted to welcome some of our contributors uh, from the course. It's probably worth saying that we have um, a phenomenal array of uh, really diverse contributors from, from all parts of the world actually contributing to this course um, from um, a wonderful, passionate 23-year-old woman from Afghanistan who works in European policy all the way through to uh, a woman in her 80s who's been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize three times. So delighted to have today's conversation. This can be a very relaxed, informal, interactive conversation where we'll be responding to your questions. So please put them in the chat and my colleague George will be monitoring those questions. Um, so to kick us off today, welcome Nishma, Janice, um, and hopefully we'll be hearing from Rav soon. Um, Janice, I wanted to start with you. So, so just for, for people who are less familiar with the course, uh, the first presentation of which will launch on May the 2nd, we're looking at sort of women's leadership and women leading change through these lenses, these three lenses, kind of a macro systems level lens, a sort of a meso organizational team lens, and then also an individual lens. And I wanted to ask you first, Janice. So you have had the good fortune of working in a number of different industries in different geographies, different parts of the world. You're dialing in from El Paso this morning, I believe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So just to just to kick us off, really, the the role of of, of women in in business leading change. Um, what's been your experience of of how that works best? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Can you hear me properly? So great. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So I yeah, as you said, I've worked in so many different industries. I've worked in what people sometimes consider as male dominated industries, like the aviation industry. And I have seen different examples of people leading change. I've seen women, um, particularly, sometimes they're the only ones in the table. <laughs> and it's been very interesting to see um, a lot of those role models, so to speak. And I was initially surprised because I had almost a stereotype that, you know, if you were a woman and and you had children, or you were a caregiver, that there was absolutely no way you could be leading an organization, and I was so wrong. <laughs> um, or that they were women, they may not have had, they may not have a family of their own, but they were young, um, youngish, you know, they were like, I think in their mid 30s when they became a board member or a legal counsel. Um, and so I was so surprised that there were so many different examples of women leading change in organizations. And what made that really successful was, um, an open mindset within the company to allow, I mean, to almost, I didn't want to use that word, but almost like to, to look out for people who had those sort of skill sets and be almost um, willing to try out that sort of leadership, if you know what I mean. I found that as almost a commonality that they were, there was an openness um, to identifying these types of women and bringing them into senior leadership. Brilliant, yeah, that, that's great. And apologies, Janice, I was terribly rude. Tell, tell us a little bit why you're in El Paso. <laughs> and you mentioned aviation, but just give us a whistle stop to tour through your, your career. Yeah, so my family moved in the middle of the global pandemic <laughs> from Hong Kong to the US. I've been working in Asia for nearly 15 years. Um, my background is I'm an environmental scientist and an economist. Um, so naturally, I'm working in the field of sustainability for over for nearly 20 years. Um, yeah, and I worked in different industries, as I mentioned earlier, from aviation to hospitality, real estate, and now for a consumer goods company here in Texas. Wonderful. And, and would you mind sharing why you've moved to El Paso? And, uh, and yes, again, get... the pandemic. <laughs> Uh, I was talking about it with my husband last night, and I said, um, if I it hadn't been the in the pandemic, I probably would still be in San Francisco, or I, I would have moved to New York, um, because I thought I was a city girl. <laughs> I mean, living in Hong Kong, right? And I used to live in London, but you know, the pandemic really 
uh, focus. It, it, it almost like forced me to think about my priorities as a mother um, and also as a person. <laughs> and I decided, you know, I, I needed to spend time with my children. And also I want, I was very interested in understanding how do you work with companies that are um, they're not, they're not exactly in the fortune 100, but I wanted to understand like, how do you help medium and large size companies integrate sustainability? And, and I just thought, you know, it'd be, you know, for all of those reasons, uh, together, this is the reason I'm in Texas. Fantastic. Great. Well, Texas is lucky to have you. Um, <laughs> and then what other observations would you have? So I imagine that many, many of the um, people tuning into this will be working in business organizations um, and having worked in the hospitality sector, in aviation, as you said, in transportation, and now for a, a global um, consumer goods company, you know, what, where can business have the most impact um, when it comes to delivering the the future that we that we want and need and also sort of a second part to that question where have you seen women have the most influence and, and, and particularly when it comes to partnerships and collaborations right yeah let me just start with a partnerships and collaborations point so when i was in hong kong um i was part of a group called the women's foundation and it was um it was basically a venue or it was a, a group of women who were helping each other. And, and I, jo Zoe, I mentioned it to you earlier, it was kind of jokingly like they were hyping each other up, right? Because you believe this narrative when you grow, when you, I mean, I remember when I was 12 being told that these are the things that you're not supposed to do as a woman or as a girl, right? And you, you keep hearing that from society you wonder why there are magazines, kid, uh, like teen magazines about falling in love and makeup. And I wasn't really into these things, right? Like, but I was almost forced to believe that this was what it took to be a real woman. And then it took years to kind of unlearn that narrative. And so this is the reason why, you know, I think partly the reason why the Women's Foundation was so successful is building a new narrative, which is the truer narrative. <laughs> Right. And then building that allyship, building, you know, getting men in to understand the barriers and how they're also impacted by those barriers. So it's really about this empathetic understanding of 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 men. Um, and, and it's not about it's not we're taking stuff away from men. You know what I mean? Like it was about us, all of us, all of our boats rising together. So I found that really helpful. And even up to today, now I'm in El Paso, I'm still in contact with them. If I kind of need, um, you know, just a friend to talk to, or even if I just, um, sometimes I'm really quiet in the WhatsApp group, and, but just to see these women succeeding is enough um, motivation <laughs> to overcome the challenges I face on a daily basis. And then to your first, the first part of your question, um, you were were you asking about what what sort of things would look like well, what, what's the specific role of business so having worked in a number of different sectors um how how can business in in particular as a as a sector be a force for good again as i said earlier right it's also um sort of a it's role modeling what society what you expect from society and if we keep talking about, oh, women should have equal rights or we should give um, more opportunities for women, business has an opportunity to provide that, you know, almost like a vehicle of that sort of change. And I, in, in all the companies I work for and all the industries I work for, I often tell the people I work with, we need to reflect the, the people that we serve. Um, and if it's all just men, <laughs> Or you know, then then it becomes it, it, you're reflecting a certain type of demographic, and that's not representative of all the other markets that we serve. And so that's really the sort of the reason why business is helpful in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such an important point. How, how do we reflect the people that we serve? How do we make sure that those voices are heard at the table? Um, which leads me nicely on to, to you, Nishma. So. How do we also create cultures where people feel that they can bring their whole selves to work and actually speak up 
and challenge others and um, you know, feel comfortable raising their voice, if you like. Um, so Nishma, perhaps you might want to just start a little bit sort of telling us where you are in your career, because like, like many, I think, have, you know, you started in, in communications, then looked in engagement and sustainability. Tell us where you are now um, and would love to get your reflections. You know, there's a lot of talk these days about psychological safety, and I know that that was a, a big focus for you in your last role at, at the pharmaceutical Roche. And would love to just get your reflections on why why is that important if, we, if we're to ensure that we can lead lead change and and, and lead successful innovations yeah absolutely so um yes yeah, so you're right so my background in my career i started off in comms in pr um and then about eight years ago was introduced to corporate responsibility and it was then that i started recognizing just to your earlier point about how business can really be that force for good how businesses can develop products and services that are commercially viable, but actually still really benefit society. And following that, I then made a complete career change about five years ago into uh, my previous role, which was at Roche, as you said. And most recently there, I was leading corporate responsibility, well-being, and sustainability. And this is where I started to learn more about this concept of psychological safety. And this is a term that was really coined was initially coined a few years ago by a behavioral scientist called Amy Edmondson and at its highest level it's defined by the, by the belief that people in a team should be able to feel safe when taking risks so essentially this is about being able to feel like you can speak up you can make decisions you can take action um, you can fail at something but not feel scared about any potential repercussions. In fact, it's the opposite, where if you do these things, speaking up and making decisions, that you also demonstrate you're accountable for it, but actually that's also recognized um, and rewarded. And if this is done really well, like if it's done in a team, in, in a team where everyone is feeling safe and feeling like they have a role where they contribute, what this actually then in turns, the benefits of this, is that it really starts encouraging that creativity, um, bold new ideas being created, um, really helping to unleash a team's potential um, and really helps foster inclusion as well. Because when you create this safe space in a team, you, what inadvertently what also happens is that people start having this real sense of belonging because they feel like they're, they're part, everyone's part of this decision making. Um, so. I guess my advice to anyone, if you're in a team, you're building a team, you're developing a team, really think about how can you create that safe space where everyone feels like they have a chance to contribute um, and feels like they belong. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it's one of those things that sounds absolutely wonderful, but I imagine is much harder to, to build into practice because effectively you're trying to embed it into the culture. And we all know how difficult it is, it is to change culture when you when you look back at, at how you did that what what worked best would you say and where have you seen it work best and and i guess also then reflecting forward you're in a new organization now you've only recently started at legal in general you know what what are your tips for yourselves and others that might be in, in new roles like janice has not been that long at helena troy you know how how can we as individuals bring that psychological safety to our to our teams how do we model it? So, so yeah, this is something that it's definitely not going to happen overnight. Um, and it also shouldn't be seen as an end goal. I don't think it's something, it's not something you reach and then you're done. Um, it's it's almost like a something that you have to nurture to, to really help embed it into the culture of an organization. I think one of the things that's really key to psychological safety is communication. Um, we all know how important communication is, you know, every day in our in our working life. And um, in many teams, quite often communication can still just be top down. But it's also about not only thinking about two way communication, but also almost side to side. So how can you encourage people in your teams to talk to one another, to share responsibility and to share that accountability for the decisions they're making as a team together? Um, that's really important. One of the other things, and then, you know, how do you encourage that safety? So how do you encourage people to feel safe in communicating with each other? 
um, how do you get your teams to feel like they're being heard and they're being listened to? How do you listen to your team members as well? And as I said, this takes time. Um, so there are like practical steps that you can start implementing um, to, to kind of nurture this and to encourage this behavior. I would say one of the first really is kind of that self-reflection. So as a team leader or as anyone who's really passionate about this area, how do you take some time to self-reflect and think about your own position? Are you demonstrating vulnerability? Um, because that's really important. It's important to be open and honest with yourself um, as well as with your team members so you can encourage them to, you know, that it's OK to, um, to share vulnerability and to behave in this way as well. One of the other things that's really important is to talk about failure. And it's something, um, you know, I, I, I remember for many years feeling really petrified if I had, if something had gone wrong, partly that's also the perfectionist in me. Um, but, you know, we're human, no one is perfect. And the only way we're going to continue to grow and develop is if we not only learn, you know, we often hear about learning from our mistakes, but we've got to share those mistakes as well. So as a group in your team, you can learn together, um, share together and, and move on together as well. So yeah. um, I think the second part of your question was about my new role. So, yes, I recently joined to um, join Legal in General, which is a financial services organisation in the UK. Um, I've just joined the sustainability team and I'm only one month in and I think I've already seen actually how difficult it can be to be yourself and be really authentic when you're new because you're still trying to um, you know you're meeting new people you're trying to understand the culture this new culture but I think one thing that I've learned is just try and be yourself from the outset um, I know from experience when you try and be someone that you're not it's not going to last very long so you know whatever your natural style is um you know if you're an i'm an introvert for many years i thought that was there was something wrong in being an introvert and now i see it as a strength um so i guess my advice is yeah wherever you are in your career if you're somewhere new if you've been somewhere for a long time just definitely always be be yourself be authentic because it will encourage others around you to to be that way as well yeah that's that's brilliant advice Nishman. it is interesting isn't it like when we when we go through these transitions how it really puts into sharp focus you know the practices that can support us or also perhaps the things that you know kind of trip us up um and i think i think it's interesting in in women needing change we look at sort of masculine and feminine leadership traits and obviously both men and women can have both and i think you know, we 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 seen this clear evolution from the old days of the that old kind of hero leader model, which was I have all the answers and you will just follow me, as opposed to well, what do we think? You know, how might we approach that together? Because actually, of course, we don't have the answers. The world is complex. It's changing. You know, it's volatile, ambiguous, uncertain, um, and we can only come up with with new interesting solutions if we're listening to all voices and, and bringing some of these other voices to the table so thank you for that nishma i'd love to invite um rav into the conversation if she's here i think she looks like she might have just um dropped off um but hopefully um rav will be you are there rav just speak up i can't see you um uh, so Rav is, is, is will hopefully be bringing the perspective of, you know, particularly um, her work with um, women in STEM professions. But perhaps Janice, Janice, I can I can come to you on this as a woman who started in STEM. You talked about starting off as an environmental scientist, and 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 that's obviously you know been a been a strong outlook for you. Um, just curious to to know, you know, you you talked about how you know you had to sort of in a way peel back some of those unhelpful narratives about how you thought you were supposed to be and what you, what you were hearing from society in terms of expectations of girls. You know, what would be your advice? I mean, it seems to me when you look at the numbers, we have so far to go. You know, if you look at the numbers of of women in in STEM STEM roles in engineering in you know technology. 
Um, how can we really start to build momentum there? What, what's your personal experience? Yeah, I mean, growing up, I was very lucky that my mom was adamant that I was not going to believe the narrative. <laughs> my mom wanted to be a scientist and she wasn't, she was of that generation where she was stopped. And I think that that moment when she had me, she was like, I'm not going to let that happen to my daughter. <laughs> And, um, and yeah, and so my mother, every time I'd come home and I'd be like, the boy said I can't do this, or the teacher said I can't do that. And she would immediately be like, don't believe them. You can be whatever you want. So she was my, she was my hype girl, my mom. <laughs> and I think that now we're in that a lot. I, I don't know if a lot of people are listening in are either mothers or aunts or sort of the older person in a younger person's life. I would highly recommend that you be that person cheerleading that other girl. Um, I did, I did, I grew up not seeing any STEM role models in women at all. So it was very difficult to say I could do that. There was no one I could look at. Maybe, okay, Rachel Carson, that was it. Like, but that was like in the 60s <laughs> and I wasn't born in the 60s. So, um, and it was like, it was very, it was very challenging. Um, but as I said, having a support system, particularly my mom, who believed in that I could do anything that I set my mind to. And I know it sounds very cheesy to say that, but it really helped because there are going to be lots of times where I was the only woman in the classroom <laughs> or, you know, as an environmental scientist, you had to go to these places like take samples in a lake, go to a landfill. And immediately my teachers would assume that, oh, you need you need an excuse letter because you don't need to, you won't need, you don't want to do this, right? Like they, they would make, even women teachers would make these assumptions, right? And I know it is coming from a place of love. I often tell myself that, but I've had to have the courage to say, no, I actually want to do this um, and, and not be bothered. You know, I come back from, from let's say going to a landfill and I had a class. And I had to know going to class and I'd smell, you know, like landfill <laughs> and I'd go to college at a college class and everybody would look at me. And it, even at that young age, I was already telling myself like, you know, don't believe the narrative. Um, I didn't quite say it that way, but it's, there's a level of strength. Um, yeah. And knowing that um, you, you, you had, as Nishma said, you really had to find and accept who you are and be who you are. Is Zoe still there? Oh, I think she might be frozen. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> I was just going to add, um, Janice as well. When I used to work, I used to work uh, with a lot of kids in um, in schools in my previous role for a pharmaceutical company. And one of the things that I also realise is that STEM opens up so many doors and has so many opportunity, but the perceptions that are still held of what a career in STEM looks like are actually quite they're really outdated. So a lot right. of kids thought your only option if you're interested in science or healthcare is to be a doctor or a nurse. Or a dentist, yeah. and and that existed when I was at school, which was many years ago. And those some of those um, opinions and views just they haven't moved on. Um, so I think there's such a big role that not only teachers and education systems can play, but also businesses can play to really show to show kids, um, you know, young adults, what opportunities there are beyond once school finishes. Um, because if you don't see it as well, if you're not exposed to it. It's very difficult to make some of those relevant education choices you might need to make, um, you know, when you're kind of going through through the through the system at school and at university or further education. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, there's a lot of resources out there. There's a Netflix film called Women um, Who Look Like Scientists <laughs> and just being being able to relate. Right. Like I can do that. Um, yeah, I've had a lot of young girls come up to me and say, I never knew that this was a career. Like I was always taught it was being a doctor or a nurse. And yeah, and so I've been, in, I've been part of these um, initiatives just to show other girl, young girls, what are the possibilities and, and because when they, they see it in someone, they're like, oh, I could do, 
I think the most important thing, not just to visually see, to name it. Like, oh, I can be fill in the blank, whatever that thing is, right? A computer engineer or this. Yeah. So that's, yeah, definitely. And I can see how businesses would support that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think the role model part is so important. It's so wonderful to hear how you had your mom um, mm -hmm. as your role model. Um, but, you know, it, it, if, if people don't have that, almost looking outside of their household as well to see who could potentially be that that role model but also if you take it if we take it one step further like from school into the workplace again role models are so critical to demonstrating the change that you can make and, and not being female you know not letting that be a barrier um and yeah those role, what i've always found is those those role models are just having people that you aspire to you know that you can learn from that that will help you along the way as well is really important right yeah and i think it goes beyond just stem right like a lot of the industries that i mean the ones i used to work in the ones you're working in right now are mostly there are a lot of men in senior leadership and yeah. being able to kind of point out like you know we're, we're open to different types of people <laughs> it doesn't need to be just one certain type of person and to be and to we actually see it you know i've you know as i said when i was in the even aviation industry i was so excited when i saw a female pilot like i couldn't believe it <laughs> <laughs> and and i would almost be like i it would almost be all like um seeking a sister and say how did you how did you overcome this because i know how how challenging it is right to be in that in that sort of re really male dominated fields and there's another one I used to be in real estate with construction. That's another, wow. yeah, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, that's tough. Yeah. And I would always be so um, curious and interested to know, like, how did you guys overcome this? This is not easy. I can only imagine, um, you know, what, what you, you guys have overcome. <laughs> Hi, Zoe. Yeah, Hi, Zoe. Oh, I think we lost Hello, her. Hello, everybody. Oh, Just to okay, go ahead. We can't hear you. Right. Apologies, just to prove that we are live. That's never happened to me before, so uh, I decided to drop. What joy. Um, but I'm glad you're having a lovely conversation, the two of you. <laughs> Great. So so where did we get to? I So um, I wondered if we could sort of go full circle. We've, we've kind of started at the sort of, you know, the role of business. We've talked about organizations and teams and culture. Um, and Janice, you've alluded to it a couple of times, you know, how, you know, how we can, you know, the, the importance of having our sort of support bench, if you like. Um, and really curious to, to touch on now sort of at a personal level, you know, how can we best build our confidence and, and resilience? Um, it was interesting when we were interviewing the sort of 30 plus contributors for the course and, and one of the things that they talked about, you know, was what would they wish they'd done differently or what would their advice be? And it was always be bolder, be bigger, more courageous, ask for more. Um, so Nishma, I'm, I'm curious, how do, you, how do you build your resilience and, you, and your confidence? What, what's worked for you when you, when you think back over your, your career? Yeah, so for many years, when I look back, I almost wish that certain traits I have, I didn't see them as a negative, which I kind of mentioned before. So, I, you know, I am an introvert and in a, when you're in PR, it is mainly full of um, extroverts. So you feel like the odd one out and you feel, um, yeah, you're different. You just feel like you're different. Um, and I, you can sort of tell by my voice, it's quite softly spoken. So for many years, I thought you had to have you have to be really assertive, you have to be really aggressive um, to get far, you know, to, to get far in your career. And it was over the last few years where I've really um, learned to embrace those natural characteristics of mine. Like, you know, I can't change the, the sound of my voice and, and um, yeah, just really learn to embrace it. And I think just having that ability to see it as a strength, like turn it around and use it to your advantage. If there's anything that you're feeling is holding you back, I think my advice would be to really take that time to reflect and see how you can turn it around. Um, because you, 
we're all unique that's what makes us different so use that as a way to kind of stand out in the crowd as well yeah no i think that's i think that's great advice and on the flip side of that as someone who is an extrovert you know i've often felt self-conscious about that you know i've i worked in san francisco for a number of years and i remember when i moved back to to the uk it was like oh my god you're such a cheerleader you're so you have to be so you know big and noisy so i think it's um you know how do we embrace those qualities so janice you asked to specifically talk about imposter syndrome in the course yeah. Yeah. Um, which re really surprised me. Um, so, and you talked about a number of ways that you've addressed that. So, talk about that. How does that show up for you, and and what way, what techniques do you use to to support you with that? So, very much like Nishma, I know, as though you will not believe it, I am an introvert, <laughs> and um, that's just not my natural state of being. And I, very similar to Nishma, I was told that that's not good enough. Like, why are you so quiet? Why can't you tell me what you think now? And I'm like, I, cause I'm thinking, <laughs> like, I, I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> and, um, and that's really a lot where a lot of my imposter syndrome came from. Cause I was told again with a different narrative, you're like, okay, you're great. You're great as a woman, but you're not really speaking up. And I'm like, I need time to think. And what I've learned is, and, and there was moments in my career where I tried to live up to other people's expectations or definitions of how I should behave. And it really exhausted me. And I think Nishima will agree, it's very exhausting to try to be an extrovert. <laughs> and, um, and so what I've done is uh, got into meditation. I've done a lot. I've been meditating for seven, eight years now. Um, I don't know if I mentioned as well, Zoe, that uh, I, I, I exercise, I train, that's the term I use. I train five days a week, um, like CrossFit type, like I do 50 burpees, that, that type. <laughs> I weight lift. And part of that is just to remind myself of what I can do. Um, it, it's just me reminding myself that a lot of the things that are holding me back are just in my mind. And a lot of the, and I have a choice to accept the narrative that's given to me. I can say it's almost like a RSVP to a party, like somebody saying to you, Janice, this is who you are. And you're given a choice. People feel like I don't have a choice, but you actually have a choice. You can like in Clueless, you can RSVP to a party or not. <laughs> so I choose. And so now I choose not to believe and not to RSVP to my own imposter syndrome party. <laughs> and uh, and I do that through you know just reminding myself of the things I'm capable of and as I said a lot of that comes from meditation and you know just training doing a lot of cross training yeah I, I, I love the anecdote you gave in the interview which was um you know where you'd like turn up in a meeting going I and look around the room and go I bet I'm the only person who has done who has 100 time. burpees before I came up <laughs> yeah, it, it is so empowering when I go into a room or a virtual room thinking that way, like, I'm, the only, I'm sure I'm the only one who's done this. So it just breaks my imposter syndrome. Yeah, if I can, um, and I love that. Just add to that, Zoe. Yeah, if I can just add to that as well, because I yeah. struggled with imposter syndrome um, for many years, and it didn't actually affect me till I'd been working for around 12, 13, no, more than that, about 13, 14 years. So that's kind of when it hit me and I didn't even realize it was a thing. I didn't realize there was a term for it. I just constantly felt like one day I was going to get found out. And it was that feeling was like this weight on my shoulders for, for quite a long time um, until it was recognized actually by my manager. And then it kind of felt like, oh, I can talk about this. But the one thing that's actually helped me as well is just realizing that what used to really um, hold me back is when somebody would ask me a question, particularly a senior leader, and I'd feel like I have to have the answer because if I didn't have the answer, clearly I wasn't good enough. And I think one thing that's really helped me is just realizing you cannot possibly know everything. You cannot have the answer to everything all the time. And it's OK to say, I don't know. I don't have the answer, but I'm going to go away and look into it for you and I'll come back to you and then it helps I think Janice I'm probably right to say you're a reflector like me as well and then it kind of helps that kind of being able to go away reflect think about your response and, and go back but definitely don't always feel like um, you have to have all the answers because it's just not possible 
Yeah, and I, and I think the sort of extension of that is that you probably know more about your topic than other people in the room. Um, That's true. And, and really sometimes true. we can psych ourselves. Sometimes we can psych ourselves up by over preparing and then fixating on the things that we forgot to mention. No one else knows the things that we've forgotten to mention. So, um, no, that's that that's great. That's great advice. Um, and I think certainly from my perspective, I think certain certain industries. You, you well, I know that I can get a little bit. Um, Sometimes being very last minute can be a real kind of an adrenaline piece. But actually, if I want to be my best, it's how can I prepare? How can I turn up on time? So some of those basics. So would love to have questions and comments um, from people listening in. One question that we have had um, that I want to put you to, bo to both of you, and then I'll look at some of the other questions is, um, do you think businesses are open to women as leaders? And it's interesting, again, if we look at the facts, we know that only 6% of the FTSE 100, only 6% of the Fortune 500 um, CEOs are women. So the data is, is not, you know, is not good. And actually, again, Janice, you talked earlier about the impact of the pandemic. I think that's had a disproportionately heavy impact on women as well so you know what what's the answer to that do we think businesses are open to, to women as as leaders janice i'll turn to you first yeah more so now than ever before in my career <laughs> like i um i think a lot of businesses are on waking up and and have already been in the past few years they're they understand that they need women um, and they need different types of people, not just women. Like we're talking about overall diversity, right? They they're very interested in in that, and I've never seen such an openness. Um, and again, as I said earlier, I've learned not to ask permission. Like I just go and open the door, and you'll find out. You'll be like, you almost like psych yourself out. Like the door's not open. The door's not open, and so you don't open it. You're like, because you're worried that if it is locked, and you're like, oh, then it is locked, and wow, that was so humiliating. But then you find out that actually the door is open. You just need to kind of, you know, we you, you can't wait for other people to to open it for you. And so I learned I learned that. And I say that as an introvert, it is very tough. You psych yourself out like, okay, the door is closed, the door is closed. And then I realized, oh, actually it's a jar. It's open, I just have to push it. <laughs> Yeah, again, we had a, a lovely analogy from um, um, an incredible woman who was on a webinar we did a couple of weeks ago. So her name's Perna Sen and she was Deputy Director of Policy for UN Women. And she said, sometimes we need to decide what our role is. You know, sometimes we need to be the person that kicks the door down. And sometimes we are the person that follows through after someone else has made that effort. No, and I think often it starts with just asking asking the questions. Um, what's your experience, Nishma, in terms of, you know, is it, are we ready? Do we think businesses are open to, to women as leaders? Um, yes, yeah, so like Janice, um, I would say, yeah, absolutely. And I've definitely experienced that in the recent, with the recent organizations I've been employed with and they're, you know, kind of all being quite big brands. Um, but it isn't just about women as well. They're really open to change um, with embracing diversity in all the different forms that diversity comes in. Um, and, you know, where I work at the moment, Legal and General, part of the organisation is called Legal and General Investment Management. They're, they're an they're a investor and they've actually um, made really bold commitments in this place where they won't invest in other organisations that haven't got a diverse board like or ethnically diverse board so you can really see um it's this businesses are, are really pushing other businesses as well to kind of drive their change um and ultimately you know it's kind of um well it's as we know it's good business practice but i think businesses also just realize they're losing out on so much untapped potential um in terms of talent if they don't really start making change and getting this right yeah absolutely and another question that we've had um which i think is really is a, a super question and i think ties back in with the whole psychological safety piece is how do you bring your whole self to the interview process um and in, indeed 
your indeed your job. Um, you know, bringing bringing the personal aspects through. Um, and, and Nishma, I, I know that you you talked about a particular technique that you had with your teams, or you had in cute, big diverse teams at Roche. So so any thoughts on that? And again, you've both been through the interview process <laughs> recently. You know, what was that like? And perhaps how be interesting to reflect on how is it different this time round to say 15 years ago when you were going for perhaps and you know one of your first jobs Nishman do you want to kick off yeah so funnily enough there was something I did really differently in my most recent interview which was one I was just really really honest about what I could and couldn't do and everyone might be familiar with um the way the difference between men and women and how they respond to job ads and there's this statistic I kind of I don't know what the exact number is but something like 80% men will be 80% they'll look at it and think right if I can't do 80% of it that's fine I'm going to go for it anyway whereas women will feel this need to tick every single box on that job description and when I was in the interview for legal in general I actually openly said I cannot tick every box on your job brief um, but why would you want someone that can because they're going to come in do everything and just be bored whereas for me and, and I said you know I can't tick every box but I'm willing to learn and that's what you'll get from me this real appetite to learn and grow and develop because this really is an opportunity for development so I think my learning was just really be yourself and I know it sounds quite a cliche or quite obvious but it's actually quite difficult particularly particularly in an interview process and most of them are virtual right now as well so you don't get a sense of um, body language in the same way but just trying to be yourself and recognizing it's a two-way thing it's not just you selling yourself the employer's got to sell them themselves as well um, because you've got to fit each other um, so you know be yourself and if you don't get it then there's nothing else you could have done in that situation yeah. yeah that's great and and actually the statistic is because i use it in in some of my work men will apply for a job if they've got 60 percent of the qualifications and women will apply for a job if they've got 100 percent of the qualifications um and of course one of the really interesting trends we're experiencing at the moment people are calling it the great resignation you know this huge sort of reassessment of what kind of work do i want to do how is it aligned to my values um, you know, where do I want to spend my time over the last couple of years? I mean, it's absolutely remarkable the record levels of people um, that have been voluntary changing jobs. So you're absolutely right. It is a two way conversation and starting with actually they'd be lucky to have me look at all the assets I'm bringing and you want me to be learning on the job as well. How about you, Janice? What were some of your insights? And then I think Rav might have sound. So I'll, I'll come to her after after I've heard from you. Yeah, as I said, it, it's a mindset shift, right? Like you were led to believe that you had to sh show, you had to be a certain different person in an interview. And similarly, like Nishma, I thought like, I'm, and what you just said, Zoe, I just, I really had to change the narrative in my brain and say, I have something to offer. And if this is not going to work out, it's okay. I again my i love analogies as you know so my analogy was like it's almost like dating if this person is not gonna like you then it's better to know now than be miserable six months down the line you know what i mean like you don't want to be in a relationship and that's what work is in a company it is having a relationship with someone it may not be a person but it's a set of people and if they're not going to accept you for who you are, when you show them who you are during the interview, it's going to be pretty miserable <laughs> when you're there for longer, right? So I, it took a while. It really, really took a while for me to understand that this is also about the company selling themselves to me. Because we're always thinking it's me selling myself. And once you do, when you think that way, immediately you're going to think, what can I do to get this, right? Like it's, it's that. Um, yeah. That's my advice. Yeah, Super. Thank you for that. Um, Rav, can you hear us? If so, please speak. I can see you and I can see your um, microphone, but I'm not hearing you. That's a shame. 
oh well um we're trying very very hard so the irony that it's our, our champion of um, women in technology um, who's having the issue but but do keep trying um so um what are you most proud of um and perhaps it might be perhaps it might be successful collaborations successful partnerships um and and, and what were the qualities that you brought to that, that that made it successful you know maybe it was the success of a campaign or an initiative or a, a team um nishma starting with you um, I think in my old role, um, when I worked for Roche in the UK, it was just making positive change and a positive difference, you know, having the opportunity to do that every day, um, which is why I'm so passionate about the area I work in now. But really having the ability to make to make that change, but also have a being able to influence a change in culture there as well, um, particularly like you know, in the area of sustainability and well-being um, and, and helping to drive, it wasn't just me, but working with people to drive things like psychological safety. Um, I was responsible for the mental health strategy and, and trying to embed that into the organisation as well. So, yeah, I think just generally being able to influence as much as I was able to in my previous role um, is definitely a huge success for me. Yeah, that's great. And 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 how how cool to be responsible for mental health and having well-being in your title as well. Really, really interesting. Um, how about you, Janice? What what are you most proud of? And and what is there still to achieve for you? Because I, I know that you are an achiever. <laughs> yeah, I call my life pre-children, my PC and my my post-children era and my pre-children era. <laughs> And one of them was um, the one before I had children, I was working on a mathematical model for the aviation industry, an economic model. And it just sort of ties into the STEM. And I remember having these conversations with a lot of people who are, who are older than me, again, in the aviation industry, very male dominated. And I remember being in Chicago and then explaining it. And I can, I wish there was no, there was no, I mean, maybe there were iPhones, maybe iPhone one, I have no idea. <laughs> but I wish I'd taken a photo of them looking at me because they were the same age as my dad and having that conversation and, and sharing with them and they were challenging my math skills, which, you know, Zoe, I would rather go and do a calculus problem than go to a networking party, like seriously. But they did not know this. The room did not know this. So I was so in my element. And even up to today, when I see how the aviation industry has used that work I've done, just I cannot believe that I did it. And I can't believe I was pregnant with my daughter, my eldest at that time. And I look back and think like, wow, like, I can't believe I had so much courage. Like, who was that woman? <laughs> and then the other part, obviously, I'm always going to say, I'm always going to say motherhood is one of still will be my greatest achievement at the end of the day. Um, because to, to raise children in a world that has, is changing so rapidly and constantly reminding both my daughter, of course, with all these, you know, women empowerment principles, but also raising a son who understands that his identity as a male does not have to be what society tells him. Because a lot of it is also about high, our very high expectations of men as well. And that can also, we don't talk a lot about that. So I know we, we will in the course, in this course, but it's, you know, I, as a mom, I understand now, and I'm married to an amazing guy. And, and when I look at it, I think the great, it's a great, it's a great thing that my husband doesn't feel intimidated by what I want to achieve and what I've achieved. And again, he's been a, a part of that support system. And I want my son to be that to whoever his partner is going to be when he grows up. Right. So that I, I'm not quite, that is the achievement I'm trying to meet Zoe. I talk to me in 40 years and I'll let you know if I need it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I love it. Janice. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, fantastic. And I, I think that's, that's so good. Um, so just, um, I just, I'm just being um, sent some of the other um, questions that we've got. 
the um, um, so um, one of the participants has said, I noticed that most of the participants of this web webinar are female sustain sustainability managers. It would be interesting to have HR numbers by sectors, for example, in male dominated industries. I wonder how we can address the environmental female mental burden and still be change leaders. What are your, what are your thoughts and experience about that? Um, so I think perhaps it's talking to top tips again, really, for around around resilience. Um, I think I think I've got that, but do please clarify in, in, in the chat if I've not quite quite got that right. Um, any any different ways that you've behaved when you've been in sort of more male dominated industries to use the language of the question the questioner and, and, and what have you just taken forward perhaps as, as best practice in terms of you know how how to succeed not how to, how to be your best i don't use the succeed language any thoughts janice from aviation to hospitality to yeah a lot of men have daughters <laughs> And I, yeah, and as I said, I'm always about commonality um, because again, being an introvert, it's just the easiest way to connect. Um, and you know, when I use the introversion, it's more because I'm, I'm very observant of other people. I just like to sit and then observe. And I realize that a lot of the men I work with have daughters and that's sort of how I make the connection. And I'm like, hey, you know, and I don't quite say like, hey, help me so that you can help your daughter. It was more like, um, re I already realized that there's a soft part in their heart for someone like me. And in, in some ways, a lot of the mentors I've had in my life were men who wanted to build a better world for their own daughters and even their sons, because they realized that, you know, my son can't have the burden of taking care of the family. And I'm talking about from a work perspective, not just from a chore or rest perspective. And a lot of these men I notice have a level of empathy. A lot of them are scared about, you know, for those who have daughters, they're really worried about the world that their daughters are getting into. And so that's, I really connect with a lot of, of, of the people I work with in, in that role. So a lot of, even in a male dominated industry, and we use that, right? But in reality, if you look at the back behind the scenes, a lot of them have women in their lives. And mm -hmm. it's really through that that I, I connect and I and I ask for mentorship. Again, ask, ask, ask. You don't mm -hmm. get, you know, you, if you just sit there and, and almost like in a party and waiting for someone to say, hey, talk to you, you can't, no one's going to do that. So you're going to have to go up and, and take and, and, and gain the courage to ask. And I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time I get a yes. The only time I got a no is was like this person was mentoring so many other women. So I felt like, okay, <laughs> that, that's good enough. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really interesting. I think it's like, how how do we build inclusive cultures? Because um, one of our contributors um, in, in the Women Needing Change course um, was a man who'd worked in sort of automotive industries most of his life. And, and it's actually, you no know, toxic cultures are toxic for most men as well, if they're not an alpha male. So recognizing, um, you know, actually it's around how do we build inclusivity? And how do we build that sense of psychological safety so that pe people can bring their whole selves? Um, so we're coming towards, towards the end. I'll keep an eye in terms of if there's any other questions. Um, Nishma, I loved, I, I wanted to ask you to share your top tip for when it comes to leading teams, which I have now, I must admit, I've just stolen your your tune in idea because I think it, you know, when it comes to building psychologically safe cultures, it's just such a simple, practical way of modeling that. And I was wondering if you could share that. Yes, this is a, a really simple um, technique that was done at Roche, uh, my previous employer, and done by teams like Roche is a global organization and it was done like in many places all around the world. And it's called a tune in. And it was to start every meeting with a really simple tune in, which is a how are you? And is there anything preventing you from being fully present in this meeting today? And it just gives everyone the chance to share, like, you know, particularly when we went into lockdown and you could be wait. Well, when you might have had kids because you're, you know, in the UK or many places, schools were closed. So you could have had kids in the background, be waiting for a delivery. Um, it could be anything. And it, just a chance for you to say, you know what? at, at in 30 minutes time, I'm expecting a delivery. So I'm going to have to just 
nip out for two minutes and come back again without having those sorts of thoughts where on your mind it gives you a chance just to share what's on your mind so that you can fully focus on that meeting or if something is preventing you from focusing because something's on your mind actually just share that because it's amazing what a relief almost that can do that can be as well um, so it's really simple you go right around the table with a quick tune and the most important thing is is to be open yourself so if you are feeling for whatever reason you know something's bothering you something's troubling you as someone who's driving that meeting leading the meeting you've got to be honest with your team for it to be um, reciprocated as well yeah i think that's a great idea and and i often will use that so if i'm in a workshop i might say you know i'm i'm slightly nervous about this bit you know i've not this is the first time i've done it so i'm really curious to see how it lands um, and I think also in an online environment, just just calling out what we're seeing, you know, with energy levels. If it's our team, it's like you know everyone's gone really quiet. Do we need to you know, take a break? What what's going on? Um, how about you, Janice? What what would be your your key advice, perhaps, um, but for others? You know, particularly how do we flourish in this kind of you know hybrid world or predominantly virtual world? Right. Yeah, it goes back to what I said earlier, and I think Nishma probably touched it on on it as well. It's again, how no matter, it's still very cliche to say this, but be your authentic self. And um, as I said, you get when people um, offer you a story or a narrative about yourself, you if you know who you are, and this is where my meditation practice comes in. If you, and mindfulness practice comes, if you you are the expert of yourself. <laughs> And if somebody comes in and says, you know what, I know Janice more than you do, you're going to be like, are you sure? <laughs> and, and that's almost like a reminder to yourself, like you get to choose the narratives that are thrown at you because you know who you are. And, and it is a very, I'd say very, very tough to get to that point in your life because as women and as young girls, when we were young girls back then, we were told a very different narrative and it's really just unlearning that. And it's, I have to say it was very painful and I really struggled. But the moment when I had like, I get to choose, I get to accept the narrative. And I was, that's really when that level of empowerment, that's when I started working on the imposter syndrome. It really opened so many doors, both literally and figuratively for me in my mind and at work. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Janice. I think I think that's a, a great point on which to end. Um, so, Nishma, Janice, um, thank you both for the conversation today. Um, you both are featured in our Women Leading Change, which uh, makes its first outing on March the second. Um, just a reminder that we're we're looking at leadership th from both a systemic perspective you know what are the what are the, some of our big levers for change um, at an organizational team level and then an individual level um, and I think we've touched on all of those today um, and also a reminder that we had a webinar a couple of weeks ago with some of our other wonderful contributors that if you've enjoyed this conversation you can check out that as well so thank you if you're joining us live today Thank you if you're watching the recording. Apologies for our few technical issues. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll have, might even have smoothed some of those out with the recording and look forward to seeing you hopefully on the course. So continuing the conversation. Thank you both very much and uh, for a great conversation. It's been wonderful chatting to you today. And thank you everyone who's joined us. Thank you. Thank you.